Do you know what's there? Waiting. Beyond that beach. Immortality! Shake it! It's yours! Welcome, world! To Immortality Lab, here is Brian Devonshire and Hi. I am Christian Martorana. Today, we are going to be talking about high altitude training. Um, does it help you? Does it harm you? How does it affect your daily life? How does it affect your workouts? Um, yeah. So let's bada bing, bada boom, get bada right. Bing. You see those, those crazy people that wear the mask around. You, you know, you've seen them. Yeah. Everyone the listening time. too. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, all the like time. The, the Bane mask that we got right here. Literally the Bane mask. Yeah, the one in the gym and stuff. Yeah. And so. And here he is wearing an N95 too. Yeah, he is. He Is it literally? Yeah. Someone photoshopped that onto his face. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> That's great, dude. Um, so you posted a pretty cool YouTube video, actually. The one with Patrick McCowan. The, oh, uh, yeah, yeah. the author from The Oxygen Advantage, which if you haven't seen our uh, podcast on breathing, that's who we largely are talking about from there. And so pretty cool, interesting YouTube video. And he basically gives his opinion and his word on what he thinks about, you know, oxygen training masks. And so basically what he's saying is that it's not going to increase your VO2 max, but what it is going to do is it's going to put you in a more hypoxic environment, right? And when you're doing that, you're getting more used to uncomfortable breathing, if you will, during exercise. So then in the long run, you'll be able to sustain a harder workout for longer time without well, the feeling of breathing hard i guess i think didn't he say it doesn't like he put a, a pulse ox on his finger or he tried it himself and he's it like it does decrease your o2 sats like but not enough you're right it, you, it, like he said yeah, it yeah, got yeah, yeah, down yeah. to the low 90s but that's not technically hypoxic right he said it, it needed to get to like 85 and it was at 93 right. so yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And so it's not that's, a hypoxic environment you're right it, but it does um and I watched a different video, not this one, but he, it was like 50 minutes long. I didn't watch the whole thing, but he was talking about it specifically because of COVID and stuff. Um, uh, shit. What did he say? I lost my train of thought completely. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's all shit. good. It's all good. Um, but yeah, you're, you're totally right. It's not a hypoxic environment, but it does still pool the CO2. Oh, and that that's going to allow you to create that that feeling of hunger for air right yes okay i remember now thank you this yeah, is exactly yeah. what he was talking about in that video too you said it almost exactly the same way also <laughs> <laughs> so yeah he says uh, air hunger or like something like that and it's basically because um, I mean, when you when you see the o, the O2 sats decrease just wearing a surgical mask or something, um, so that tells you that uh, either you're not breathing in enough air or it's uh, it's pooling CO2 there, and so you, with the Bohr effect, that means you're breathing or you're you're breathing in more CO2, and that's basically telling the the hemoglobin in the lungs to like. Uh, give up some of its hydro I mean it's some of its oxygen so it reads as a lower o2 sat uh, and that makes sense it does that yeah that definitely does and another another uh, main point he was saying is it doesn't yeah so the o2 sats don't get low enough but he also says um, like those were, they don't, they don't bring the, the CO2 level uh, above 45. Right. So he, right, that's right. what he said in that video. Like it, it'll bring it up, but it's not going to bring it up to a, the above normal range. I, I remember him saying, yeah, like it'll come up to like 44 or something like that. Right. It went so from like, like the 40 to 44 or something. Yeah. And um, he was saying 
that uh, are you talking still about Patrick McCown? Yeah, that's yeah, yeah that okay. one video. And, yeah. and so, yeah, I was seeing that he was saying that it, it that increase, though, up to 44 is still a pretty significant increase hmm. of um, he was using mercury, you know, like using mercury, how well your body like that was the that was the unit of measure he was using. Oh, yeah. You know? Just the pressure. Yeah, it, yes, exactly. The pressure. And you could handle four four more units of that. And he said that that was significant enough to be uh, significant. And he, and he was saying that the high altitude masks, those actually pull enough CO2 to get above that, like around 55. So uh, the upper limit's 45. And then with, with the training masks, you'll get up to uh, 55. Right. And so there's been so many studies done actually, man. And like, it's cool. Cause I found some before COVID I found some new ones in 2020 and as well, and they still have contradicting numbers and it's like, okay, what, what's going on here? So like, here's a few researches that said altitude masks do not work. They do not. And also we do know this, that they do not replicate altitude training. We do know that through a lot of researches as well. But so there was a 2002 study at, at Texas Tech, researchers at Texas Tech, and they investigated the effects of respiratory training. And so uh, they did it in seven collegiate distance runners. So just seven of them. Um, and the athletes did different performance tests before and after a four week respiratory muscle training program. So, to see if the program had any effect on their fitness level. And so they did show marked gains in direct tests of their respiratory muscle strength and endurance, mm -hmm. uh, basically saying how hard they could breathe. Like how strong their breathing muscles are. Yeah, exactly. But it didn't show any change in their VO2 max or in their mm -hmm. performance to run to fatigue at 85%. So it's like they can do the same amount of work and it just feels easier, but it doesn't allow them to do more. Yeah. So the, the one I looked at, it, it increased the VO2 max, but it also during the training period, it was like six weeks of, and then during those six weeks, they did high intensity interval training. Yep. It's both, both groups increased their VO2 max. And they said there was no like real different, uh, uh, change in magnitude. I don't really right. understand. I, I think we saw that same research as oh, well. It was okay. I, uh, I'm sh yeah, I'm sure. So right now I'm going over the researches that say it does not work. And then I have some that say like it does work, you know? Okay. okay. So I think we read the same one on that, which is great. Um, the study that I just read right now, like it doesn't have a control group. You know, so there's Ooh. nothing to necessarily compare it Yikes. to. It's just, did they get better? Yes, they did. <laughs> you know, um, also something to keep in mind, it's four weeks. And like uh, Patrick McCown was saying six to eight weeks before you start seeing benefits, definitely at eight weeks. Right. You're and right. a lot of these studies, all of them were like four to six weeks. None of them were that long, which was interesting to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was I think, another. I think study. the one I was looking at was it was six weeks. I'm I'm trying to find it, so it might actually be a different. Let me find okay. it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There was a, another study done at ASU, oh, and wow. they they trained nine cyclists. They were divided into two groups. So one was a control group, and one was um, a group that participated in that respiratory muscle training. This was a three week study. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. The cyclists had their breathing muscle strength and endurance measured before and after the training, as well as their VO2 max and their performance over a cycling ride to fatigue. The results were the same. The respiratory muscle training significantly improved, um, but VO2 max did not, and their performance did not either. Um, and it, it, it led to no improvement compared to the control group either. So that's basically what you were saying with mm -hmm. the, the magnitude doesn't change if you're using a between the groups. Yeah, correct. They both increase significantly because you're doing a respiratory, you're, you're doing a cardio workout and like a pretty vigorous one, you are going to improve, but it's not because of the mask. 
dude um there just there isn't enough science on this I, yeah I, that's I, there's like a handful of articles i could find about this i i agree i totally agree because here's some researches that say that it does work so in 2004 there was one done at u of a and this also looked at cyclists 20, 20 trained subjects same thing respiratory muscle resistance training group and a control group which did simulate breath training against no resistance. And then, a, oh, that was a sham group, which simulated breath training against no resistance and a true control group, which had no breath training. So there are three groups, right? And this study did find an increase in VO2 max in the experimental group compared to both the sham and the controls. So like how many variables are in play in order right. to say something, you know? Um, like these things, these things can be biased as well because some studies are three weeks, some are 15, you know, and that U of A one was one of the longer ones. So maybe, maybe that's what showed the difference. And, um, ultimately, man, it's, it's what you're saying too. Like there's not really conclusive studies on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just not not a whole lot. So there's there's a mix, but there's really only 10, 15 <laughs> total yeah. studies on it. Exactly. Um, and like, so it, then it's like, okay, are altitude masks worth it? You know, are they worth buying? It's like, sure. You know, if you want to pay money for it, that's fine. Ultimately, it's not going to make that big of a difference to your performance, or actually it's not going to make any probably it will get you more used to being in a hypoxic environment or, or getting there anyways, you know, which will then make work easier to do. You won't do it better. It'll just be easier to do it. So I, it's everyone, like the consensus basically is what, what I got was that it, it doesn't really improve. It doesn't have the same effect of actually being at elevation it, it more acts as like a, a resistance. So uh, Patrick was talking about that when he, he, or in a different video, I think at like a 10 minute interview with somebody, he slapped a mask on and like the, the filter, it just creates a lot of resistance. And so that, you know, it trains your, your breathing muscles. And that's what all these uh, research articles I found where it's basically just, um, it trains the muscles strength so at the end of the training exercise, you feel like lighter, you know, it's easier to breathe because of that. Sure. Like, like perceptive wise. Yeah. Yeah. I, I could see that totally. And that's and then, what Patrick likes too. He wants, that's why he does those little training things. It's like, so you, that you exert less energy breathing and you know, if you feel lighter, I guess. Sure. The David Blaine effect, huh? getting your heart rate down to five. No, I'm just joking. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, yeah, that's, that's kind of the gist that I was getting from him as well. I didn't necessarily hear the, the lighter part, but yeah, he was mentioning like, not only is it training the muscles, it is also training psychologically, you know, for your brain to get used to being used to CO2. It, exactly. Exactly. So then that work isn't as hard. Um, and so that, those studies were just done on athletes, right? And control groups, but they weren't done on just like people. I don't know, just normal, right. normal people. And so, so I saw you found uh, research on how it affects nurses or something along those lines. I found a couple as oh. well. Yeah, that was, that was relating to uh, N95s. Yes. Like, so, yeah, specifically the N95. N95, and yeah. the tight fitting respirators. So not the, not the one on Bane's face in that picture. Um, it's more like a, like an actual gas mask, you know, like a. Gotcha. Yeah, 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 yeah. So like those, the legit ones. With, okay, okay. With those, you actually do have a lot of CO2 retention. And even the CDC tells you, like, if you're wearing stuff like that, you should probably take a break or like supplement with oxygen. Um, yeah, for and sure. This, this was before COVID nonsense, 2015. And I, I think, I mean, since we're on the mask subject, like the, the surgical masks and the cloths, 
like they will they will decrease your your o2 sat a little bit probably but i mean i've seen like there's youtube videos of people putting on multiple masks at like seven masks at once and it doesn't really affect their, their values at all so and that's that's what i was gonna say as well because like i saw that research that you were looking at that does say it does conclude that there is um an impeding on the breathing and such right right with the ventilators yeah yes and so then i found i found another one with uh using yeah wearing n95s um and it's the physiologic and other effects um for long-term use you know like a, a it was using nurses medical intensive care unit nurses mm -hmm. and so what that one concluded was that long-term use of respiratory protection did not result in any clinically relevant physiologic burden for healthcare personnel. Huh. And so it's like, okay, I, I guess those are two different studies though. Right. One, this one is physiologic, you know, problems where yours was just like, does it impede breathing and or does, does it, it increase like CO2 and, you know? Yeah. But right. um, so, so to, the, the question is like, okay, you know how a lot of people are like, oh, we have to wear these masks for so long and you see the pictures with like all the lines and people are like, Oh, my face is destroyed yeah. from wearing these masks. Like it's kind of bullshit, right? Like nurses well, have been doing it forever and yeah, they're and surgeons <laughs> and, sur and they're fine. Right. Um, so you, you might get like a transient increase in CO2. Um, but you know, you are required to have a break like every six hours or so. Right. Mm -hmm. So you're going to take the mask off. Um, maybe like, I think, yeah, there's the CDC, do, they, you know, they tell you, they advise you to go somewhere where you can do that, take the mask off or supplement with oxygen. So you're going to only basically have that high CO2, um, for a couple of hours. And th they also say it only like the, the CO2 only gets up to a high damaging level after like an hour. So that decreases the time that it's damaging you even further. Um, but then your study says, you know, there's no long-term effects. So, right. You what, know, yeah. Which I wouldn't, one I wouldn't worry about it too much. You know, clearly there's, it doesn't really do a whole lot. Otherwise everything would show you that it does. Right. It, yeah, exactly. It would be conclusive <laughs> as and, opposed to contradicting. Dude, I want to talk about this paper bag thing. Hold on. Yeah, 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 yeah. This, um, and we talk about homeostasis a lot on this, right? Right. <laughs> so this one illustrates it so perfectly. Um, so this is this is from 1989, so pre-COVID uh, nonsense. Uh, so they they did this was so like hypoxic hazards of traditional paper bag rebreathing in hyperventilating patients. So you know you, you know. Um, that's the technique people do when they're uh, freaking out. They're having an anxiety like attack. on an airplane or whatever. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you get the, you get the paper bag and it like calms them down. Um, and that works. That's what this study shows. It works. Um, when, when you're hyperventilating, you're exhaling a lot of CO2 uh, and we know CO2 is good. So when you get too much of it out, it has all these horrible effects. Um, so that's why you rebreathe the CO2 through a paper bag. And then you get back to baseline and you calm down. Um, but this is what they did. So they, they had these people, so 14 men and six women with an average age of 36 years. Um, so, and they, they had these people like hyperventilate into a paper bag for like two minutes and they measured um, like the CO2 output. So let's so see. Did here. they, did they, Get, they got patients who were hyperventilating and then they're like, here's a bag. Or did they get people to um, just breathe into they, the bag? Yeah, they just told them to hyperventilate into it. Um, so like or, intentionally just uh, like breathe as fast as you can through your mouth into the bag or like, is that how? I, well, I think they had them hyperventilate and then their CO2 dropped. Gotcha. And then they're like, okay, paper bag time. Okay. They so measured, yes, they were hyperventilating patients. But the, I think, no, not like, um, through anxiety, they just were told to do that. You know what I gotcha. mean? Gotcha. But the the point still stands. Um, it's still the same effect. Yes, I think. Yeah. It's, and look at this: a number four craft brown paper bag is what they used. By the way, 
<laughs> Making mac and cheese and paper. Bags. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know. That's okay. That's great. Um, but check this out. So they, they measured the, C the CO2. Um, let's see. After 60 seconds. Dude, it's, it's so hard to read, understand how they organize their, their sentences in these. With all the numbers, right? I know, like, yeah. How yeah. They're like respective to the, yeah, I hear you. I okay, hear you. so after 30 seconds of rebreathing, um, and um, CO2 was 38.7 at uh, a minute oh shit look at all those fucking numbers man dude i i know it's horrible i it's can't horrible. yeah honestly but uh, so at two minutes okay so it's oxygen and then CO2. it goes up to 40.5 at two minutes two minutes and then after two minutes it goes up to 41 so my point is like it goes it fixes the issue but then your body like adapts and it doesn't, the CO2 in your blood does not, not rise as quickly as it did when the CO2 was really low. So sure, like it, it reaches the upper limit of the normal range and it's like, it gets harder and harder and harder. Yes. Yeah. It starts balancing out. And yeah. even, even they did it with, with a paper bag, which is. <laughs> it's a paper bag. It's like, uh, it's like objectively harder to breathe through than a surgical mask. Absolutely. So <laughs> you take this information, they're hyperventilating into something that's much more dense than a mask. And they, it barely got up to the upper, upper limit of CO2 level in their blood after like two and a half minutes. Yeah. Three minutes even. Yeah. Look at that. 41, yeah. 41.3. Yeah. And so yeah. Hi homeostasis dude. Um, Right, our body's like, oh, you're putting me in this environment. I better get used to it. And within three minutes, it starts leveling out. It's just like, oh, okay, yeah. we can live here now. Exactly. Like, yeah. I wonder how long you would have to breathe in a paper bag for it to be like fifty. I don't know. Or would it ever? Would it ever get there? Like, why did they stop at three minutes? I, well, I think it would. I don't know why they did that, but uh, well, if you think about the respirators. Uh, they, you know, the CDC tells you after an hour, that's when the CO2 gets high. So it's, that's probably where it is, you know, like an hour of regular breathing though. Sure. Sure. Okay. Okay. That, that I guess makes because sense. Because it, so less than an hour, your body can just, you know, deal with it. It can, it can manipulate the, the bicarb in your blood and, you know, it can get rid of the CO2 different through different mechanisms. And it's, yeah, it's not that bad. It seems like. Exactly. Exactly. It's not that bad. So like the masks oh, over time, I feel like masks, if anything will help, but in the meantime, it like, it sucks, you know, like there was, um, effects of surgical and N95 masks on cardiopulmonary exercise capacity. And this one did conclude that ventilation, cardiopulmonary exercise capacity and comfort are reduced by surgical masks and highly impaired by N95 masks mm -hmm. in healthy individuals. Um, but it's like during the session, yeah, that makes sense. And that's what this is saying. It's, it's during physical exercise. But right. once you take off the mask, you're going to probably be a higher performance than you were had you not been wearing the mask for your whole career. Yeah, I, I saw something like that, too. And it was, uh, they had two graphs of like the they measured the O2 sats and the CO2, or I think it was just O2 sats of people not wearing masks. And like, so the, the people with masks had just constantly lower O2 sats. And then when they when they exercised, like in that period where they exercised, uh, the people with the masks, it decreased more. Um, but I, I think that just goes back to like the it's, it's re providing resistance from the air getting in and you are breathing in a little bit of the CO2. So with the bore effect, you get lower O2 sat. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's like putting a piece of tape over your mouth at night, you know, just breathing through the nose. It's, it's literally the same thing as just breathing through the nose and never mouth breathing. Right. Yeah. Or breathing through a straw or whatever, you know, it's, yeah, it's providing resistance and yeah. 
that's that's it man it's not going to kill you though <laughs> yeah yeah exactly it it'll be okay it'll be really okay uh yeah watch the breathing podcast <laughs> please go back <laughs> go back and then um i know you wanted to talk about this epo thing oh yeah dude so this is why this is why people wear these masks these funky looking masks um but we, as we know it it doesn't it doesn't work the same way um so when you when you go to a high altitude place it's you're you're actually having you're living in an area that has low oxygen that's the main thing and when your body senses that it's going to make um this this thing called erythropoietin yeah and epo. it's epo so that is just going to stimulate more red blood cells and you know cyclists do this like it's called doping back in the day i'm sure you've heard of that right um i don't know if i've ever doping like in cyclists mm -hmm. I, I haven't heard that term yeah that's they use um so it's a, a different type of epo so it's a recombinant human epo um and so it, it does the same thing but they can they can test it because it has like different genetics to it which is weird um but yeah so it just increases the red blood cells in your body and uh, cyclists love that, you know, you have more endurance. They can go, they can do so, that. So by calling it doping, they're just, are they taking something that makes this happen or they're just training at a higher Yeah, elevation? they take, they take it. I think okay. they in inject it, but I'm not Okay, really okay. Sure. So this can be made, this is made by our body naturally, but it's yeah. all, it also can be man-made. It yes, can be injected. manufactured, okay. but it's, gotcha. a, this one is a little different and they can test for it. So that's gotcha. why, um, who was the dude with the, the nut cancer? Who was that guy? Uh, Armstrong. Lance Armstrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, he was, a, he was doing that. He was doing this. He was doping. And gotcha. there was also this interesting thing. Like they had, um, these really high tech motors in the, in, in the hub of the wheel. Have you heard about that? Man, my internet just went like <laughs> robot mode. Oh. Yeah. I'm back so, now though. They, so they did the doping and did you, have you ever heard that they did the, they, like they put these really, really small high-tech motors in the hubs of the wheels? Really? Yeah. And, and they, this was, they didn't find this out after like years, but they just, they stuck a little motor in there and um, it, you know, it saves every little bit of energy saved. Right. It, and it just pushed them to the top like that. Wow. Wow. So they, there's a lot crazy. of cheating, dude. There's a lot of yeah, cheating. Yeah, so much, man. I wonder, like, who found that? Like, I told you. I told you he was cheating. They dude, find a little motor in there. It was because their bikes were, like, 500 grams heavier or something. Wow. Like, that's how small the motor was. But it just gave you that little bit. Yeah, and it would. It would, man. It's cheese. I know. Like there's shaving some... your leg hairs on a sprint, you know? Uh-huh. That's smart. nuts. Um, anyway, so this is why people do um, high altitude training. So you get the EPO, you get more red blood cells, which means you have a lot more oxygen delivery to your muscles. You, you have more aerobic capacity. You can run longer. Um, you can do everything longer, harder, faster, you know? Right, right, <laughs> right. So like, okay, how long does this EPO last in your body? Like, okay, just say you're training at that high altitude, right? Yeah. And you develop X amount of EPO in your body. How long does it stay before homeostasis when you're back at regular elevation, I suppose? Um, yeah. So when you go into that environment, this is the, um, the typical is the, the hemoglobin level increases about 1% per week to like a maximum is what I found. Um, uh, like a four four percent increase is like the max okay does it decrease at the same rate uh yes so the uh the epo just stimulates red blood cell growth so when when you reach um homeostasis like that's going to go down um well actually i think if you're if you're living in the high altitude like the epo uh epo level is going to stay about the same and right. then when you go back down to sea level or whatever, it's going to decrease at about the same rate. So like in four weeks, the EPO level is going to go back down to baseline. 
but the the red blood cells that it created the four percent extra red blood cells those live for 120 days ah interesting which is pretty cool yeah that so is. if you yeah people do this and so you need to do at least four weeks for more than 12 hours a day and this is the main reason why those masks don't work because like, you're not doing 12 hours a day you know you put it on at the gym and then right. you go home, you don't have it on for 12 hours. Right, right, right. Like you would have to literally be in a oxygen deprived environment as well. The, all day almost. Yeah, yeah. So even even just that, the masks don't work. And, and, and so this, like if you're at a higher elevation, do you have to train at a higher elevation or just literally being up there four weeks is how long it'll take? Uh, yeah, both. Okay. Train up there and live up there. But I mean, if you like, you're if you're strapped for cash or whatever, and the like, if you if you're training in Flagstaff at like seven thousand elevation or whatever it is, and you can't afford to stay up there for four weeks straight, you know, you got a you got a job in Phoenix, right, and or something like that, right, uh, and you don't want to. But if you want to make the drive back and forth, you could do that because if you know, as long as you're spending like twelve hours a day up there yeah yeah but it, then it gets hard because i mean you can't work eight hours and then spend 12 hours in flagstaff and then go back home and sleep there exactly so but you could sleep in flagstaff yeah but then yeah then you're if you're strapped for cash you know you do need to rent a hotel or something and or sleep in your car i mean yeah literally just drive up there to sleep every day to spend yeah. four hours and then sleep <laughs> and then there's your 12 hours yeah dude you could if you want to do it that way you could do it. I mean, as long as you're in the oxygen deprived environment for 12 hours, you're good for four yeah. weeks. And then you got to race. Bam. You're going to do better. You know, what's going to happen is eventually someone's going to, you know how like there's like little oscillating fans and air humidifiers, air purifiers, all this and that someone's going to make some thing that changes the oxygen inside of your room or whatever. And you just mm -hmm. have to, watch man 10 years five years everyone's gonna be in their own little oxygen chambers be fucking sweet or I mean, lack thereof yeah i might do that too i'm like even though i'm not a competitive athlete or anything i would just do it anyway because breathing's healthy for you or having uh the epo right no that's what i mean it's just like it's if it's gonna make work easier like why not you know yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of benefits of having, I mean, extra oxygen delivery is great because, I mean, you can do everything easier now, like every exercise is easier. Um, well, yeah, and not only not only physical performance, but mental performance as well. Yeah, I'm sure there's a correlation there. But like, I bet if you if you track the IQ of people in Flagstaff versus Phoenix, Maybe there's a correlation there. That knows? would be interesting. That'd be interesting. You'd have to make that study like legit. You'd have to find people from the exact same demographic or something like that. Yeah. You know, that'd and, be and Flagstaff is like one of those traveling states where like half the population leaves after school. Yeah. So that probably wouldn't work. But... Right, right, right. Maybe. I, I don't know. That'd be interesting. But yeah, man, like, Takeaway points are that wearing a mask during fitness isn't going to do much for you. Nope. If you consistently wear one, like consistently are res adding resistance to your breathing, your muscles, your, your respiratory muscles will improve, but your, your performance is not going to. So it's yeah. just going to be easier to breathe. Yeah, that's it. Which it, that's kind of cool, you know? But you want the the EPO. Um, so here's some other things because it it, it induces uh, mitochondrial biogenesis. So this is great because it, it that will actually increase your VO2 max. So that's going to that is what's going to increase your performance and everything. Um, Absolutely. And um, it's going to fight Alzheimer's because well. Uh, Alzheimer's is associated with decreased 
mitochondrial and mitochondrial function also. So, I mean, that's a, I'm just going to do that just for yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. And one of the studies I found, they actually said that the people uh, in the study, they, you know, they, they got into the environment of the high elevation and with the newly increased EPO, it was uh, cardio protective. So it, it's like, um, yeah, it's just another mechanism to prevent your heart from dying in these stressful situations. So like you, if you have more cardio protective happening, happening, you know what I mean? Cardio protectiveness happening. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what I'm trying to say. Like the more protected your heart is the better, right? Uh, naturally. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. But like, what would be cool too? like, I guess if I was rich, I would do this or just, yeah. Um, live in a high enough elevation place for, you know, four weeks. And you said the effects last for 120 days, right? Yeah. The, so live for four weeks and go somewhere else for 120 days and bloop after right. and then just go back for four weeks. And then, so then you're always living in that high EPO. There you go, dude. Life, that's, dude. That's the best way to do it. Yeah. It's like, oh, here we go again. Four weeks on top of Mount Olympus. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be fucking awesome. <laughs> Dude, that's what the that's what the snowbirds do, man. They they move, um, you know, to Arizona in the winter because exactly. it doesn't, doesn't snow here. Yeah, they ruin our traffic. They ruin our, <laughs> our roadways. Dude, like, go home. Something I I learned recently is, um, like we were talking about heart disease is like the number one killer. Mm -hmm. When you when you look at um, the deaths, it's it's seasonal basically. Um, I don't think I can find it here easily, but yeah, there's more, there's more deaths from heart disease, um, kidney disease, and a lot of diseases actually, but with heart disease, it actually spikes a lot in the winter. Really? Yeah. Which, and so if you're a snowbird, um, you know, you're avoiding the winter. So you're, you're basically doing that you're living you're living longer like you're not going to die from heart disease as much as everyone else is if they're living in like wisconsin all year right 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 so when the temperature decreases you have a less chance um yeah, is it just, temperature based I, is it pressure based dude, it there's a there was a lot of factors i was trying to get my head around it but it's yeah yeah it goes yeah it comes down to temperature and with that you know your your thyroid is going to try to regulate that and so your your thyroid hormones change and i mean you get the low vitamin d being in okay. a, a winter area and also um you know like when winter comes around you're you're not as active so you're like you know right, you're right. a couch potato and then suddenly you have to shovel snow like, right. <laughs> that's a heart. That's a heart attack waiting to happen right there. I hear that. I hear that. So it, for sure. And then your body has to work in that cold harder to regulate the temperature. Like I just found something right now that said 2015 study showed on death rates from circulatory problems, uh, heart disease and heart attacks all rose as temperatures fell. So every one degree Celsius hmm. drop in temperature that's about two degrees Fahrenheit, uh, came with a 0.49% increase in deaths from all causes. Damn, dude. That's, that's pretty significant. Half a percent increase in those three major ones from every two degrees colder. So yeah. when you're like, you're, like you said, cold. in Wisconsin living in negative 20 weather <laughs> and we're over here in 80 degree weather, that's a mm -hmm. hundred degree temperature difference. That would be, geez, that's like what forty Celsius. I don't see. So yeah. <laughs> Who knows if it translates 25? exactly? That's literally twenty percent. That'd be twenty percent. That is so significant. Yeah, dude, I have to find this thing now. Shit, ah, <laughs> I have I to forgot, show it to you. I forgot which woman it is. There's this um, this really old Asian woman, and she looks amazing for her age, uh -huh. and she she swears by it that the reason she looks young and everything is because she 
swims in an ice cold lake every single day. Oh yeah. And she's like, and like, to me, it made sense. Like, okay, if you're, if you're in a colder environment all the time, everything's going to be moving slower within your body as well. But, um, apparently not like i don't know maybe she just really good genes and she's just doing a very vigorous exercise program i don't know yeah so i think in her situation like you were just saying that being with every degree uh decrease like you get more death right right but in her situation she i mean she's probably is she rich <laughs> i would imagine <laughs> she's, she's so. well off okay. i would imagine so so I, I bet she's living in a place where it's nice weather a lot and then she jumps into a cold river or whatever. And then you get the, the hormetic effect, right? Sure. So, I mean, we've talked about that before. And that's definitely going to make you look younger. And make you yeah, live longer, that, that too. That is very true. I, now I want to find this, this woman. Here, I found the thing. I'm going to share my screen. Do it, do it. Check it, chickity chick, Chinese chicken. Can you see that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can. So this this popped up on Reddit because uh, for like two weeks there, um, hold on, COVID was actually the number one killer in America in April. Like it, it it beat cancer and heart disease for like two weeks right there. Wow. Um, but look at that, dude. There's clearly a huge spike in the winter for yeah, heart disease every single time. And if you look at all of these other things, there, I mean, there's not as great, but there is a hump in the winter time. Every single time. Sh stroke, uh, chronic lower respiratory disease, Alzheimer's, diabetes, uh, of course, influenza and kidney disease. Yeah. Well, also, like, whenever I visit cold places, I'm more likely to get sick. I don't know. Like, I'll get a cold or something, and I right. rarely ever. <laughs> That's why they call it a cold, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> it has to be. Yeah, yeah I think it's oh it's God. probably because of the lower temperature and your thyroid hormones are all wacky now and you get less vitamin D. Makes I, sense. I feel like Makes that's sense. the main driver. <laughs> the Epstein bar. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course, dude. Oh, how could we? They're not <laughs> they're not juicing. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, dude. Yeah. Okay, uh, did we miss anything? Hold on. Uh, you know, I don't think so. Honestly. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, so back to the EPO stuff real quick before we yeah. close out. Yeah. Um, so you, you get more EPO with low oxygen, but you get the opposite effect with more CO2. Uh, so when you're wearing those masks, you get higher CO2, like above the, the reference range. And so you're having the exact opposite effect of what you want. Right, right, right. So it's, um, so check this out. So it's, it's triggered, EPO is triggered by low O2. And it's because of this, the HIF. You see that right there? I do. Um, hold on. Let me pull it up on the wiki, on the Wikipedia. So everyone can see here. Come on. Come on now. I think my internet broke, man. Okay. It's fine. I'm going to cut that nonsense out anyway. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. My internet's back. Okay, cool. cool. It's, um, so it's the hypoxia inducible factors. That's what detects um, low oxygen. And dude, it's like this. It's this wonderful um, biological love story almost. <laughs> That's great. I know. <laughs> but it's, so you have, okay, look at this, dude. Someone got the Nobel Prize for this in 2019. Look at that. How crazy that is that? Great. So this, the hypoxia inducible factor alpha, it, that's normally just floating around and it gets uh, destroyed uh, really fast with this ridiculous um, proteosomal thing but in an environment with low oxygen it doesn't do that like it resists the degradation somehow interesting uh, and so with with the opposite with high co2 it actually uh, degrades it faster so it's like if there's anyone wearing 
uh, those masks still, and they think it's going to improve their VO2 max, you know, they're completely wrong. But if they're doing it because they want to breathe easier, then okay, fine. Exactly. There That's is, exactly dude. how I see it too. Oh, I didn't even explain the love story, dude. So I was, I was about to say, like, I can see, I can see these things bonding and stuff. I know, yes. It's the bonding baby. So, yeah. uh, so with low oxygen, the hypoxia inducible factor alpha, it doesn't get destroyed. And now it can like join with the hypoxia inducible factor beta. And it's like, Oh yeah. And then it, go <laughs> it goes in to the, the cell where it, you know, it, it it does its thing with the DNA and whatnot, and it leads to all the good stuff. Interesting. So it's like this in this perpetual, oh no, I'm never going to reach my beta. Oh, yeah. Oh no. And then, and then you, every once in a while. Every once in a while, when you go up to Flagstaff or anywhere. It's like know, my they, beta. They, they can finally be together again. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Damn. That's that great. Be, I'm going to write a fan fiction about that. Yeah, yeah, that's like I don't know if you watch The Mandalorian, dude, but <laughs> oh, they got new episodes, huh? Yeah, yeah, they put a they put new ones up. Well, I won't spoil it then. Okay, but... good. I haven't seen the second one. Yeah, Baby they're on. Yoda. I think they made they. It's second season, episode three now. But oh, shit, I'm, yeah, I was gonna make loop. reference to that third episode, but I'm I won't. So out of the loop, damn. That's like the only show that I honestly like watching. Yeah, it's pretty good. But I'm but, teaching um, my uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, hey, that's it. Worlds. This is Immortality Lab. So here you have it. Here's some information on high altitude training, N95 masks, those Bane masks that you see in the gym. Is it worth it? Not is it really. not worth it? Yeah, exactly. Are not surgical really. masks gonna kill you? No. No, uh, you're fine. <laughs> um, there's, yeah. Do they decrease? <laughs> do they decrease the O2 sats? A little bit, yeah. A, a little. Is it significant <laughs> enough to care? Not really. So thank you guys for joining in. Look at this guy, Brian Devonshire. What a stand-up guy. And here I am, Christian Martirana. Boom. Immortality Lab. Live forever, guys. Live forever. Oh. Boom. Immortality. Okay. Shake it. It's yours.